Okay, good evening, and thank you to the Copec Library for inviting me. Uh, I was there, uh, I guess, in January at the library doing a Super Bowl talk, and uh, perhaps some of you saw me there. Uh, my name is Evan Wiener, and uh, I have been very fortunate during this pandemic that I'm able to continue talking to people and uh, through the through Zoom and through Facebook Live and through pre-recorded uh, talks and uh, my adventures uh, later on this year are going to take me to Charleston, West Virginia, the library of Charleston, West Virginia, a library in Vermilion, South Dakota, probably libraries as well as in Illinois and in Michigan. So um, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to uh, continue to do talks. Uh, I've started this whole racket back in 1971 for me. I was in 11th grade at Spring Valley High School, Rockland County, New York, and a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio. He was my English teacher, and he also was the liaison uh, between the local radio station, WRKL, and the school, Spring Valley High School, and also the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record. And I see, I still see Joe, or at least I saw Joe pre-pandemic, uh, where the old teachers got together at the Mawa, New Jersey State Line Diner. Uh, and I said, Joe, do you remember my name? Or is it still student? Because in 1971, I said, student, 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 you have a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? And I said, the worst way I want to be on radio, the worst way. And I was. We did a Spring Valley High School show called Tiger Talk. That was on every Tuesday afternoon at 3.45. It was a thousand watt radio station, which wouldn't have gotten uh, into Suffolk County, New York. Uh, it's a terrible show, but that was my entree into radio. And uh, also we opened the door at the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record, and I served three different terms at the Bergen Record over the years. Uh, six years later, I'm working for a radio station, WGRC 98 New York, which you would never have gotten on Long Island because her signal was terrible. Uh, I was hired with the understanding I would work on Saturdays, which worked out well for me. Uh, I graduated a year ahead in college, so I was 21. And uh, it worked out well because I got to uh, immediately do interviews with Ralph Nader and Julian Bond. Uh, they were speakers of uh, this uh, lecture series, speaker series at Rockland Community College in Suffern, New York. Uh, but it's March of 1978. I'm still 21 years old, the big, big haircut and all that other stuff. And Steve North, who lives in Roslyn, New York, uh, is the news director and says to me, uh, I want you to go cover the New York State Democratic Fundraiser at the Tappington Townhouse uh, in Nyack, New York. And um, don't worry about it, Saturday, just come back on Monday uh, with whatever story you've found because we have no newscasts on Sunday anyway. Uh, I get there and uh, the first guy who uh, comes in is this obscure assemblyman. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. Uh, he was an assemblyman by the name of Gerald Nadler. Anybody ever hear of Gerald Nadler? Um, so that was the first guy I saw 42 years ago. And then uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senator from the state of New York, walked in. And then uh, Mario Cuomo, who was running for lieutenant governor, he comes in with this teenage kid, Andrew, and this little kid, Chris, and his wife, Matilda. And um, you Carey walks in. He's running for governor. He's got a tunnel named after him now, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And then there's a tall guy. He's about six foot four. He's really good looking, really, really good looking tall guy walks in and uh, comes right to me, probably because I have a microphone or he liked my hair, one of the two. And uh, he says, I like you. But I knew who he was. I watched Batman as a kid. He was the uh, mayor of Gotham City, John Lindsay. And he says to me, I want to tell you something. Okay. He never introduced himself, wants to tell me something. And he talks into my microphone, and he's running for Senate, United States Senate, State of New York, 1980. So I get my scoop, run back to my station, little 500 watt station, filed, filed with Associated Press, filed with uh, United Press International. Get a call from Henry Marcotte at WNEW AM radio and FM radio. Some of you may have remembered WNEW. And he says, would you like to do that story for us? I said, sure, how much are you gonna pay me? 10 bucks, sold. And with that, I spent three and a half years uh, covering stories for WNEW in New York, starting at the age of 21. 
I was not in that crowd. That's Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. In a year of contradictions, uh, you say uh, yes, I say no. Uh, the Beatles, hello, goodbye. Uh, Timothy Leary addressing the crowd. Uh, meanwhile, in Newark, New Jersey, um, the National Guard is out, state troopers are out, rioting in Newark, New Jersey. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band comes out on June 1st, 1967 in England, and then in the United States a day later. Uh, the Six Day War, there were Israeli soldiers in front of the West Wall, the Six Day War. Uh, Jimmy at Monterey, the Monterey, uh, the, the concert at Monterey, uh, and also nearby Monterey, about two hours away, Ronald Reagan, uh, was in his first year as the governor of California, uh, a year of contradiction. So was it the summer of love or was it the summer of war? It was actually a bit of both. There were hippies in San Francisco. There was a war in Vietnam. There was a war in the Middle East and there was a war in Africa, in Nigeria. Uh, the psychologist Timothy Leary told 30,000 hippies in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, turn on, tune in, and drop out. There was rioting in the streets of Detroit, in the streets of Newark, in North Carolina, in Buffalo, all kinds of places uh, around uh, the United States. There were hippies, there were hippies, and um, I'm gonna ask, well, if I was with you in the audience, I'd ask you, what was a hippie? Because the truth is, there is no definition of a hippie. Hippie was just a phrase. There's no ideology left behind by a hippie. It was a moment in time. Summer of Love, and this is in a bakery of all places in the uh, Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco where I was last November. And uh, it's a little bakery which has great sourdough bread, but it has a museum upstairs uh, where they uh, take you through the history of San Francisco and give you samples of sourdough bread. You can't go wrong. Anyway, Summer of Love, this is one of the uh, one of the, the uh, placards uh, in that uh, bakery. The hippie counterculture movement culminated with the Summer of Love, 1967. By fall, saying like Feeling Groovy, the song by uh, the, the Rascals, Feeling Groovy, on a Sunday afternoon, gave way to make love, not war chants, as you protested the escalating conflict in Vietnam and staged marches in sit-ins on behalf of civil rights. In the United States, it was a summer of two narratives. One story, fire bases, napalm, jungles, and the draft. The other, communes, LSD, flowers and rock music, and San Francisco was the epicenter of both tales. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to put flowers in your hair. I don't think that would work anymore for me. That worked for some of you. Uh, and I usually at this point ask, how many had flowers in their hair? You know, never wait, two or three women said, yeah, I have flowers in my hair in 1967. Uh, that is Oakland. Oakland is eight miles across the bay from San Francisco, easy to get through by the Bay Bridge or the BART. I'd rather take the BART, it's faster. But the US Army Oakland Port of Embarkation was generally the last place that soldiers saw on the American mainland before they headed to Vietnam. And they'd be in Oakland for a few days and um, they would get down to Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, very easy to get to, where um, they would partake in the hippie culture of Haight-Ashbury. So San Francisco was the last place servicemen would see uh, before they uh, would head out to Vietnam. By 1967, the commitment in Vietnam had uh, reached 500,000 men and women. 4,500 in late 1964, 23,000 in 1965, and then 200,000 in the San Francisco Bay Area would ship out from the Oakland Army Base. The other place was uh, San Diego. And uh, they would go to Okinawa, they would be Navy people, the Army people would be in Oakland. Hippie convergent 
on heat ashbury 70 million baby boomers came of age between uh, 1964 first baby boomers turned 18 and uh, 1983 which is the end of the baby boomer movement but 70 million baby boomers came of age between uh, those years, 65, rather 64 and 82. Many resisted quote unquote middle class shackles and advocated free love, free speech, and psychedelic enlightenment. Between 1967 and 68, 66, 67, 68, it would be Haight Ashbury that became the scene of the hippie movement and gave rise to uh, San Francisco rock sounds. Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Quicksilver Messenger Service, Janis Joplin, uh, Moby Grape, Country Joe and the Fish, The Great Society, and the Steve Miller Band. Some of those people were at the Monterey Pop Festival uh, in 1967. 1967, well, we didn't know it at the time, but on January 15th, 1967, an American quasi-holiday was born, the Super Bowl, uh, between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs, the American Football League, Kansas City Chiefs, National Football League, Green Bay Packers. Green Bay would win the game 35 to 10, a game that Packers coach Vince Lombardi did not want to take part in. He won the NFL championship. Why is he playing that Mickey Mouse League, that Mickey Mouse team? Never understood something about Mickey Mouse, though. You know how much that wrote in this world? Comcast tried a hostile takeover of Disney about 12, 14 years ago. $66 billion, $66 billion at that time. That mouse was worth a lot of money. I don't know why people in the old days used to degrade something by saying, hmm, it's a Mickey Mouse thing. Uh, so for Super Bowl, January 15th, it wasn't called the Super Bowl. It was called the American Football League, National Football League World Championship game. Uh, the Los Angeles Coliseum is only two thirds full. Uh, would be the last uh, championship game slash Super Bowl not to be sold out. Uh, these three guys, Gus Grissom on the left, Edwin White, Edward White in the middle, and Roger Chafee on the right. They were the Apollo 202 astronauts who perished on the um, launch pad January of 1967. And uh, have a friend by the name of Dick Hull, H-O-L-L, -L, Dick Hull now lives uh, near the Kennedy Space Center, uh, who was part of NASA between, say, 1960 and 1974. And he told me about uh, this practice rehearsal for the first Apollo spacecraft that was going to go up and how stupid it was, absolutely stupid it was, to have a live rehearsal with pure oxygen pumped into the tank. Uh, Dick told me a number of things uh, over the years working for NASA, saying, A, it was miraculous that man did get to the moon in 1969. And uh, when I give my 1969 talk, I talk about how Dick straightened out the signal. He was in Australia. He got the video signal from the moon, and it came in upside down, and he had to straighten it out so the world could see Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder the right way instead of going up the ladder. But uh, Dick uh, was part of this in 1967. Uh, Apollo 1, which is what it was called after the fire, was Apollo 202, was supposed to be the first uh, Apollo craft with three men on it in low Earth orbit uh, with the service module and a crew. They were going to launch on February 21st, 1967. Um, there was the rehearsal on January 27th, and uh, they pumped pure oxygen into the craft. There was a spark, and within 60 seconds, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, who was only 31 years old at the time, uh, were incinerated, and uh, the whole command module uh, was destroyed. Uh, Dick said that he had heard the final minute of their lives, and he said it's something that He'll never forget listening to the audio. And he said, it's fortunate that nobody else other than the people in NASA uh, heard that uh, video. Um, that would set the space program back uh, about 18 months until Apollo 7 uh, in October of 1968. And uh, Dick said that um, Wally Sherrod did not want to go up, didn't want to go up at all. 
but uh, they prevailed and man got to the moon by 1969. And Dick said every shortcut imaginable was taken. And we were, we as the United States, we as a state, as a uh, space program, we as the world, uh, were very lucky that we only lost three astronauts. That was it uh, going to the moon. Also in February of 1967, the Smothers Brothers. And usually when I'm talking live, I look at the crowd when I say Smothers Brothers, put up that picture, and you see big, big grins, and people are just laughing and shaking their heads because they enjoyed uh, the Smothers Brothers. Smothers Brothers were brought in by uh, William Paley at CBS, and it was done so to attract a much younger audience than they had. Ed Sullivan had gone to uh, rock music for the most part by this point, and, and hip young comedians like George Carlin although he'd come a little later after the Smothers Brothers. Um, shows like Red Skelton would have rock stars on them. Um, CBS, their programming was old, aimed at older people. Lucy, whatever incarnation of Lucy was on. Gunsmoke, Miss Kitty was no longer Miss Kitty anymore. Red Skelton, uh, they uh, had the game shows to tell the truth and I've got a secret and, and what's my line. And they had all the rule shows, although I love the rule shows like Beverly Hillbillies. I love Green Acres. Green Acres was, was my favorite stupid show. Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres, Petticoat Junction, which is dismissed as a rule show. Except Petticoat Junction, when it started in 1963, uh, the character Kate Bradley was the first woman character ever on TV who ran a business and was the central part of every plot because of the business. She was running this shady rest hotel uh, in Hoodersville. Uh, but anyway, so Mayberry RFD, Andy Griffith, and, and all make room for Daddy, and Danny, Daddy, Danny Thomas. So they decided that they had to get young and they're going to bring these comedians on. And they're going to be the young guys, the, the new Martin and Lewis or whoever else. They're going to be the young guys. They're barely 30 years old. They're going to get the audience. And they're going to be TV performers. Well, as we know, afterwards, uh, they decided that uh, they were going to talk about Vietnam. And it was going to be satire, the first satire that was on TV since that was the week that was on NBC in 1964, which came over from Britain. And David Frost hosted both shows. Um, they did get a younger audience, a much younger audience, much wealthier younger audience, but uh, the Smothers Brothers uh, took on the establishment and that did not make William Pilly or CBS or Lyndon Johnson very happy. Uh, subsequent talks, 1968, 1969. The Smothers Brothers start in February of 1969. They would have what would be a three-year run. Uh, Tommy and Dick Smothers had a running battle with CBS censors. Um, and uh, guests were pulled like Harry Belafonte because they sung a song that people didn't like. Uh, but 1967, um, they started among the people who was part of the entourage, Steve Martin. Uh, Rob Ryder was one of the writers. David Steinberg, uh, Pat Paulson will come on later on. And uh, they basically were the father of the Daily Show and, and other shows. Uh, even Saturday Night Live, that was the Smothers Brothers. Martin Luther King gave a talk on April 4th, 1967, 366 days prior to his death, 1968 being a leap year, and it was an anti-Vietnam talk uh, that particular day. Um, it was at the Riverside Church of Urban Hatton, and he talked about the war. As King says, uh, somehow this madness must cease. He's on record against Vietnam. A couple of weeks later in Central Park, uh, draft card burning started to take place. Um, and this in conjunction with a demonstration that was going on not only in Central Park, but across the United States as in San Francisco. April 15th, the Sheep Meadow, Central Park, 60 young men, some of them from Cornell University, some from other universities, came together to burn their draft cards in the Maxwell House coffee can. I don't know, they could have used Uban, they could have used Sanko, but they used Maxwell House coffee can. Too bad Andy Warhol did the Campbell's soup 
can instead of the Maxwell House can. But, you know, that's an iconic drawing for some painting for some reason. Uh, but anyway, so you got uh, draft, bur draft card burning in New York City. And that is San Francisco, roughly at the same time. Uh, a demonstration, one of the first demonstrations actually against the Vietnam War, uh, get the U.S. out of Vietnam, no negotiations, get out. It is one of the first demonstrations against the Vietnam War, but not the first demonstration about the war in 1967. That would be at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Students demonstrating against Dow Chemical. Uh, Dow Chemical was the maker of chemicals used in the war, like napalm. And the students at uh, the University of Wisconsin decided to demonstrate, not against the war, but against Dow being on campus recruiting scientists to make other things, including napalm, to help the United States soldiers in Vietnam. So September 15th, the spring mobbing protests in New York, San Francisco, and other places. About 300,000 demonstrating against the war on April 15th. Uh, it was founded in November, Moby was founded in November 1966 as the Spring Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam. Um, it would be the first of many, 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 many protests. Uh, and there is Cassius Clay slash Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali never officially changed his name. He went from Cassius Clay to Cassius X to Muhammad Ali without ever officially changing his name, which caused some problems for newspapers uh, because newspapers like the New York Times, where Abe Rosenfeld, the executive editor, said between 1963 and 19, or rather 64 and 70, is Cassius Clay never changed his name, even though he changed his name. Anyway, April 1967, Muhammad Ali goes to Houston. And he is to be inducted into the United States Armed Forces. That was on April 27th. He was called up by his draft board in 1966, notified that he would have to uh, attend uh, an induction ceremony on April 27th in Houston, Texas. He does go. He does show up. But he refuses to answer his name or take the oath of the military. And there he is uh, in 1967, uh, marching out of uh, the uh, Houston uh, facility, uh, being arrested. And there are some of the military people with him. Uh, and he's going to be arrested for evading the draft. He once said, why should they uh, ask me to put on a uniform to go 10,000 miles from my home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people? In Vietnam, while so-called Negro people in Louisville, he grew up in Louisville, uh, he was a hero. He won a silver medal at the 1960 Rome Olympics, and then he got back to Louisville and he went back to being just Cassius Clay. Uh, and he resented that uh, in the Jim Crow South. Uh, while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights. There is me and Ali, and that is 1985. That is at Madison Square Garden at uh, a luncheon. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in 1985, uh, the Parkinson's kicked in along with the dementia from being hit in the head 60,000 times, estimated 60,000 times uh, in his career, uh, sparring in, in the ring. Uh, so he really, at this point, wasn't able to speak all that well. And the sad part was he couldn't even sign autographs. He had to have Drew, uh, Drew Brown, uh, his uh, associate, longtime friend, tell him how to spell his name, Drew Bradini Brown. Uh, but uh, Ali um, would be stripped of his boxing license by New York State. He'd be, have his uh, world championship stripped of him, all without due process. Um, they just stripped him of all of, the, of his titles, he had two, and of his license. And he had no living anymore. All he did was, was a, as a boxer. He said he was not against Vietnam per se, but he was in protest. I've had people over the years when I've given talks on 67 or 69 where he comes back, or 71 he comes back because he's back in the ring, or 71. 
tell me that um, they saw him march with them in New York. It's the highlight of their march protests and careers. So the New York State Athletic Commission and the World Boxing Association stripped him of his world title. Uh, he faced a penalty of five years in prison, $10,000 fine for both effectively at the age of 26. Muhammad Ali's boxing career was over. But as we found out later on, it wasn't over. He was able to return in 1970. That is Israel, Six-Day War. For a long time, long time, back going back to 1948, there was always tension between the Israelis and uh, their Arab neighbors. In 1956, it boiled over. 1967, it would boil over again. By the mid-1960s, the Syrian-backed uh, Palestinian guerrillas had begun staging attacks across the Israeli border near Syria, provoking reprisal raids from the Israeli Defense Forces. In 1967, in April, the skirmishes got worse. Syria and Israel fought in an air and artillery engagement war. Well, it wasn't a war, it was just an engagement and six Syrian fighter jets were destroyed. And then Egypt decides to get involved, that is uh, Nasser, Gamil Nasser. And you gotta remember at one point, Syria and Egypt had merged into one country called the United Arab Republic. That did not really work out all that well, so they went back to Syria and Egypt, but they were allies in this, and they continue to be allies in this. In the wake of the uh, April air battle, the Soviet Union provided Egypt with intelligence that Israel was moving trip, troops rather, to its northern border with Syria in preparation for a full-scale invasion. The information was inaccurate. The Russians passed on some false information. But uh, the Egyptian president, Nasser, went into action. And uh, he decided to show his support for the Syrian allies he ordered the Egyptian forces to advance in the Sinai Peninsula. He expelled the UN uh, United Nations peacekeeping force, which had been guarding the border since 1956-57 with Israel. Uh, and there is one of the UN uh, border patrol watching over to make sure there's no conflict between the two. May 22nd, Nasser banned Israel shipping from the Straits of Tehran that's a sea passage that connected the uh, Red Sea with the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, a week later, he sealed the defense pact with King Hussein of Jordan. So it's Egypt, Jordan, and Syria now involved in this, uh, this uh, little uh, skirmish, which becomes more than a skirmish. Uh, and there are some Israeli tanks uh, as um, we get closer to the Six-Day War. In the weeks leading up to the war, the Syrians and the Egyptians made no secret that their joint coalition was coming to destroy Israel. Israel, Moshe Dayan and others, told King Hussein, stay away from the conflict. You don't want any part of this, stay away. On the morning of June 5th, Israel staged a preemptive air assault and destroyed 90% of the Egyptian Air Force, which was sitting on the tarmac. They did the same thing in Syria and incapacitated Syria's Air Force. And another uh, shot of Israeli tanks says they're on the move in the Sinai Peninsula. Within three days, the Israelis had achieved an overwhelming ground victory. They captured the Gaza Strip, all of the Sinai Peninsula to the east bank of the Suez Canal, new borders, and it was all done by this guy, Moshe Dayan, who was the architect of the 1967 war. He was the general for Israel. Uh, he was the minister of defense uh, at that time, and Israel doubled in size. They conquered Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, the Golden, Golan Heights in the West Bank. They got all that land 53 years ago, and to this day, there were people in the Middle East arguing about what the border should be of Israel, what they should control. Uh, ultimately, Israel would give up the Sinai, would give up the Gaza Strip, uh, because Egypt didn't want the Gaza Strip. Uh, Golan Heights is still in play, and Jerusalem, of course, is still in play, um, and the West Bank. 
uh, Arab leaders met in Khartoum in the Sudan in August of 67 and signed a resolution that promised no peace, no recognition, no negotiations with Israel. Of course, within five, six years, or six years actually, uh, that would change with Anwar Sadat and the uh, Yom Kippur War of 1973. These guys, Ringo, John, Paul, and George, would release the classic rock albums of rock albums. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is an album where the Beatles aren't supposed to be the Beatles. They're supposed to be somewhere else because they got tired of being the mop tops. And they were supposed to write songs that had no relationship to the songs that they had written before. Although, if you look at the evolution from Rubber Soul to Revolver to Sgt. Pepper, and then subsequently to Magical Mystery Tour and uh, the White Album, and uh, Abbey Road and Let It Be, you could see that they no longer were interested in being those lovable mop tops that Ed Sullivan had on. Here they are, the Beatles. Um, in Britain, the album uh, was number one. Between June of 67 and February 1968, 27 weeks at the top, 148 weeks on the charts in the United States. It was about 12, 15 weeks at the top of the U.S. charts, 88 weeks on the uh, Billboard charts, and that all with uh, one song, uh, Day in the Life, being banned by the BBC, banned by the BBC because there is a line in there, we love to turn you on. Drug reference. And I don't think uh, McCartney, who at this point was talking about how, yes, indeed, I had tried LSD, I don't think um, he was hiding the, the drug reference there. John Lennon claimed Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, LSD, was a drawing by his son Julian, who is about four years old at the time, three, four years old, of his friend Lucy. And unfortunately, uh, Lucy passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, but there was the picture of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds about Julian Lennon's friend Lucy when they were both three years old in school. Uh, the album changed rock. Uh, it was allegedly a concept album, but Frank Sinatra did concept albums in the 1950s, which had more coherency than this album. This is a, a patchwork of songs um, that um, some of them were dance hall songs, some of them were drug songs, and uh, it, it was an amalgamation of songs that happened to fit in this album. Concept, I'm not sure it was a concept or not, uh, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, were scheduled to be on this album and were knocked off by record executives that needed uh, uh, 45. Remember 45s back in those days? Um, anyway, uh, 53 years later, this album is still regarded as a masterpiece, uh, although my mind revolver is a bit better. But anyway, a lot of rock critics uh, still think this was the masterpiece. Meanwhile, a couple of weeks later, the Monterey International Pop Festival down in Monterey, where I was last uh, November. And um, this was a big gathering, but they didn't have the Beach Boys there. The Beach Boys were not cool enough to be invited. In fact, Jimi Hendrix, who was there, talked about no more of that striped shirt beach music anymore. And Jimi Hendrix, of course, played Monterey. The Beach Boys never got there. And the Beach Boys got a bad rap from Rolling Stone magazine all of these years. Uh, who, they, they basically dismissed the Rolling Stones, partly because, or rather the Beach Boys, partly because they were there, the Rolling Stones, bag, Rolling Stone magazine by Jan Leonard. Um, there were about three dozen well-known and, uh, and unknown acts, and there were all kinds of styles and sounds there. Uh, this guy, and usually I ask people when um, in person, who is this guy? Some people know. It is Otis Redding, and then I ask, what is Otis Redding's biggest hit? And inevitably, you get back sitting by the dock of the bay, and I say, well, it was a big hit, but it wasn't his biggest hit ever. His biggest hit ever wasn't sung as the signal, the signal, single, single that was put out in the United States and around the world. It was Aretha Franklin who took that song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Respect. And if you actually listen to the words, it is written from a man's viewpoint, but Aretha, of course, made it her song. That is 
one of her signature songs, or was while she was alive, but it was written by Otis Redding, and uh, he would die shortly after this in a plane crash. And uh, Respect was his song that Aretha Franklin sung and took it to another level or beyond that level as well. So people like Otis Redding and Robbie Shanker and you, Mescalela, had their first significant exposure at the uh, Monterey Pop Festival, uh, which also featured well-known acts such as the Animals, the Association. The Association with people were friendly with Brian Wilson and, and the uh, Beach Boys. Uh, the Association, the Burbs, Jefferson Airplane, the Mamas and the Poppers, and of course, Jimi Hendrix, uh, but no Beach Boys. They weren't cool enough to go to Monterey. Uh, meanwhile, while peace and love are being sung in Monterey, and while the hippies are up the road in San Francisco, about 90 miles from Monterey, these guys are halfway around the world. They're in Vietnam, and they're fighting in the jungles of Vietnam. And a lot of them, as I knew some vets, had no idea why they were there. They just, they were called to duty, and they went. Johnson's a war criminal. No more destruction in Vietnam. What's going on here? More and more and more, but summer of 67 demonstrations. In the late 1950s, the Eisenhower administration took a look at Vietnam. Vietnam had split into two, communist North Vietnam and South Vietnam. There were all kind of Cold War anxieties uh, at that time. And um, there was the old domino theory advanced by people like Robert McNamara, the uh, Kennedy Secretary of Defense, that if the North Vietnamese the communist Ho Chi Minh would prevail and knock over South Vietnam, then the rest of Southeast Asia would fall like dominoes. Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam. And when John Kennedy took office in 1961, he vowed not to allow South Vietnam ever to fall to communism. At this point, uh, the United States is in a cold war with the Soviet Union, and there is no diplomatic relationship between, if you remember, because I went to school at that time, communist China or red China. Remember, they were called communist China and red China. Uh, so the United States had no diplomatic relations with uh, communist China or red China, as we learned in those days. People's Republic of China, and the United States supported uh, Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan, which didn't make Mao Zedong very happy. Uh, also, Mao Zedong had a fallout with Nikita Khrushchev and Leonor Brezhnev. Uh, so the Soviet Union and China, they have some frayed relationships as well, which would come to a head in 1969. Uh, by January of 1965, 5,400 men were called up to the draft. By December of that year, it was 45,000. 17,000 were called up January of 66. It would increase to 35,000 a month. Young people around the nation began engaging in civil disobedience. And a couple of years ago, a woman pointed out to me, she said, when I talk about Vietnam, talk about troops, uh, because there were women in Vietnam. It wasn't all men. There were troops in Vietnam, men and women, and women had support roles, nurses and, and other, other things that they were doing. They weren't in combat, but they were in harm's way. And uh, so she said, just don't call it the boys uh, because there were girls there as well. And she was correct about that. So uh, like I said, I listen to my audience sometimes. Uh, meanwhile, you have people like Joan Baez, who in 2019 embarked on her retirement tour. There's Joan Baez uh, and her anti-war songs. Uh, George Harrison toured Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, the only Beatle to do that. And to his uh, left is the Beatles publicist or one-time publicist who left by this point, but knew George Harrison. He took him down to Haight Ashbury. Haight Ashbury was supposedly a utopia for young people. George Harrison didn't agree with that, nor did this woman up uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut, when I gave this talk, who was a banker by day and went down, and that was in Oakland, and went down to the hate at night. Uh, and I didn't ask her if she partook in anything. She's a cool woman, though. And uh, she said, no, I just went down there. I was a conservatively dressed banker. 
And she was something. I mean, she was more than just a bank manager in 1967, unheard of for a woman. Uh, and she would go down at night to check out what was going on. Haight Ashbury District was a community based district, and the people there, they were counterculturists, although I have no idea what a counterculturist is. Nobody ever explained it to me. Nobody ever really had a definition of what exactly was a counterculturist. Anyway, countercultural ideas, drugs and music, uh, the neighborhood offered a gathering to create a social experiment that would soon spread throughout the nation. Uh, the hippie community had access to drugs, and drugs was perceived as a community unifier. Uh, the woman in Oakland who went down there said that uh, it was not an ideal situation, and it quickly deteriorated. Uh, there was a group that lived there called the Diggers. They uh, were there the bit to the late 1960s. The Diggers believed in free society, the good in human nature. Uh, they established a free store, gave out free meals daily, built a free medical clinic, which relied on volunteers and donations. And this was the utopian society. But nothing has ever been written about this utopian society. There is no dogma. There is nothing, no intellectual papers about them. In fact, they didn't even last that long because the diggers would eventually have a funeral in October of 1967 called the death of the hippie. Um, Scott McKenzie. Scott McKenzie had a huge hit that year. San Francisco. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. People were flocking to San Francisco, Monterey Rock Festival, to see what was going on. Uh, the song, uh, if you go into San Francisco, be sure to wear flowers in your hair, became a huge hit. The Monterey Pop Festival down the road from Heat Ashbury cemented the status of psychedelic music as part of the culture, although Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is considered psychedelic music. And the local uh, Heat Ashbury bands, the Grateful Dead or the Warlocks, Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, uh, Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship would be propelled to star them. The Summer of Love, well, there are all kinds of people went down to San Francisco, teenagers and college students, joined in by their peers. They lived there. The allure of the cultural utopia. Middle classificationers went there just to see what was going on. And uh, the military personnel uh, from uh, Oakland went down also to see what was going on. And there is the death of the hippies, uh, or the hippie. That was October 6, 1967. And that's it. The hippie movement is over, although the word would linger on, like my old station, WNEW AM. Uh, the melody is over. Uh, the uh, song is over, but the melody lingers on, and the hippies linger it on. Those people now are in their 70s, mid-70s, maybe close to 80. Uh, the Haight Ashbury uh, area deteriorated, overcrowding, homelessness, hunger, drug problems, and crime. Uh, people also left to go back to school and to get their degrees in school. Um, and uh, summertime play was over. It was back to getting their studies, getting their degree, and going out into the world. And October uh, 6, 1967, the mock funeral, the death of the hippie ceremony. So that ends the hippies officially, although they would live on. George Harrison was there. Uh, he was there with his wife, Patty Boyd. This is what he said. I went there expecting it to be a brilliant place with groovy gypsy people making works of art and painting and carvings and little workshops. But it was filled with horrible, spotty, dropout kids on drugs that turned me right off the scene. It's a guy who sung All You Need Is Love, right? Um, I can only describe it like a Bowery, a lot of bums and dropouts, many of them very young kids who dropped acid and come from all over America to this Mecca of LSD. I asked that woman, who's the banker in Oakland, who went there by day, I said, was George Harrison's uh, description of Haight Ashbury correct? She said, it was spot on. It was absolutely correct. That is what it became. Ronald Reagan, of course, had 
was the governor of California's first year, first term, and he also uh, came up uh, with his own opinion of this. A hippie is someone who looks like Tarzan, walks like Jane, and smells like Cheetah. He had a good comedy writer, didn't he? He was in Hollywood forever, so he probably knew some good comedy writers. A hippie is someone who looks like Tarzan, walks like Jane, and smells like Cheetah. So that might be sexist today, that joke. Meanwhile, across the country, the middle of Newark, New Jersey, whenever I give this talk uh, in the uh, Roseland, New Jersey, Livingston, New Jersey, Union, New Jersey, Milburn, New Jersey, uh, uh, Springfield, New Jersey uh, area, um, it, all outside of Newark, and, and the people who are in Newark just move like 12 miles outside of Newark, stayed in the area. They tell me that they remember this, uh, that uh, either their parents owned the store, they were working there uh, at the stores that were burnt up, or their grandparents or their uncles or whatever. They said their stores were safe because the people in the neighborhood knew who they were. Um, this is a demonstration. Withdraw the troops from Newark. Youth Against War and Fascism, Free Our Black Brothers, No Vietnam War uh, Against Black People, uh, You Fascist, uh, Withdraw Troops, uh, Newark. Uh, that was what was going on in the summer of 1967. Uh, erupting primarily in the summer of love was the summer of rioting or insurrection. Um, historians can't wrap their um, their hands around what actually did happen in 1967. Anyway, uh, the rioting or the insurrection uh, happened in the East Coast and Midwestern cities, Milwaukee and Buffalo and Tampa and Cincinnati. Uh, the incidents resulted in more than 100 deaths, hundreds of millions of dollars of property damage and scores of burnt out neighborhoods. Uh, I was in Detroit three years ago um, and I still saw relics of, of the 1967 riots. Uh, when I do speak in the Newark area, whether it's in Union or, or any of those places around there, uh, and you drive through Newark, you still see burnt out buildings. That is Newark, New Jersey. That's the uh, National Guard on the street, Newark, New Jersey, making sure this guy, this little kid, is uh, moving along. Craft chick curtains, linens. Um, I was giving a talk in New Jersey and they said, yeah, they knew the craft chicks. Their store was not uh, spared. As you can see, there's all kind of broken glass in front of their stores. Uh, June 27th, the race riot erupted in Buffalo, 200 people arrested. July 12th, race riot in Newark, 26 people dead, 1,500 injured, 1,000 arrested. Body counts. Body counts were coming also from Vietnam at the same time. You woke up every day, you would hear how many Americans died, how many Americans wounded, how many allies died, how many allies wounded, how many Viet Cong killed, how many wounded. You'd hear that every morning, every morning. And a um, WCBS and WINS in New York, both news stations, although I think WCBS wasn't quite on yet, but WINS was. They had additional body counts. Race riots in Cairo, Illinois. Race riots erupted in Durham, North Carolina. July 23rd to 27th, 43 people died in a riot in Detroit. 1,000 people injured, 442 fires set. And like I said, you go to Detroit, I was in Detroit a few years ago, you can see, still see some of those buildings that were set on fire. Some of the area in Detroit that they didn't rebuild is now farmland. Uh, July 24th, the race riots in Cambridge, Maryland. Race riots in Detroit forced the postponement of a Detroit Tigers Baltimore Orioles baseball game. There was a player on Detroit named Willie Horton, a black player who is credited with helping to quell the riots somewhat back in 1967. Uh, and there is a um, hey, soul brother, leave my business alone, soul brother, I'm okay, don't destroy my business. Uh, as you can see, um, the, the rioting gear is being cleaned up uh, after the night of rioting the night before, and this guy's trying to protect his store. Meanwhile, if you're in the South, like in Louisiana, 
and, and the State Guard wasn't enough, or the National Guard wasn't enough, the State Patrols weren't enough, State Troopers weren't enough. Locals said, hey, you need some help? I got a gun, I can help you out. This guy was told, well, maybe next time. I think we're okay today, but you can go home maybe next time. Uh, the unrest was a reaction to a very, very large problem. Deep-seated anger and hopelessness simmering in many disenfranchised urban communities. Rates of poverty, joblessness, and crime disproportionately high. And Lyndon Johnson wants answers. And that guy uh, on the left, Lyndon Johnson, he, I, I knew him from somewhere. He, kind of helped me in my career. Oh, it's John Lindsay, John Lindsay, mayor of New York City. Hi, John, thank you for your help in my career. And to his right is Otto Kerman. His right is Johnson's right, your left. So it's Otto Kerman, he's the governor of Illinois, Lyndon Johnson, and there is uh, Mayor Lindsay of Gotham City who was, in, who was instrumental in me getting ahead in my career. Uh, Johnson came up with something for a commission. He wanted a commission, he put Otto Kerman uh, the head of the uh, governor of Illinois as the head of the commission, and it's a bipartisan task force. Uh, Kerner was a, a Democrat. Lindsay, at that time, was a Republican. The National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known better as the Kerner Commission, named after the chair, the Illinois Governor Otto Kerner. And the committee had um, just basically three questions that they were asking and wanted answered. Just three. And here they are. What happened, why did it happen, what can be done to prevent it from happening again? Three questions, very simple, just three questions. And they came up with some answers. There's, there's my man again, John Lindsay. Hi, John. Uh, with Lyndon Johnson uh, behind him handing somebody a pen. Um, so the Kerner Commission is handed to Lyndon Johnson and he reads it. And these were the answers. Create two million new jobs and six million new affordable housing units. Revamp the welfare system. Eliminate de facto school segregation. Eliminate abrasive police practices and establishing redress mechanisms. I'm a journalist. I've been on MSNBC, I've been on ABC News, I've even been on Newsmax. Um, my background basically is radio, radio, and radio. I wrote op-ed pieces for New York Newsday, Spencer Rumsey and Valerie Kellogg. Valerie's still with Newsday, and also the Bergen Record and, and papers around the country, including the San Francisco Examiner. This is my, uh, my, I wouldn't say expertise, but it caught my eye. Improving news coverage of the problems facing black Americans which was a major piece of the Kerman Commission. Make local government more responsive to inner city communities. And there is Lyndon Johnson. He reads it, doesn't like it, doesn't like it at all. Well, he probably agrees with some of the things in there, but there's a reason he doesn't like it. 426 page report is published in March of 1968. It would sell 2 million copies. It would earn a spot on the ninth fiction bestsellers list in the New York Times and would disappear. Gone. Here today, gone tomorrow. The Johnson administration, Lyndon, didn't particularly like what the commission had concluded because they felt, or Lyndon felt, that he didn't get enough credit for passing the 1964 civil rights legislation or the 1965 Voters Act. And Johnson threw a tantrum. He refused to support further research or even meet with the commissioners. 426 pages thrown on the table, then put in the bookshelf over there, never to be seen again. 53, excuse me, 53 years later, summer of 2020 might echo some of the things that happened in 1967. National Organization for Women. I was formed in 1966 by Betty Friedan. Upset Bill or Abzo, because Betty Friedan decided that we're going to go into politics and we're going to become lobbyists. And Bill Abzo, eventually the congresswoman from New York, was upset because Betty Friedan 
encroached her territory, which was politics, National Organization for Women. Uh, they advocated the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, enforcement of prohibitions against sex discrimination in employment, maternity leave rights in employment, and in Social Security benefits. Betty Friedan, not Bella Abzo, decided to go political. Tax deduction for home and child care expenses for working parents. Child daycare centers, equal and non-gender segregated education. That was fixed in 1972 with Title IX. Women were discriminated in 1967 in education. If you were a professor at a college aiming for tenure or not tenure, uh, getting a raise, and they said no, they didn't have to tell you why you didn't qualify. Um, and also women were routinely turned down to medical school and law school. Uh, that would change in 1972. Equal job training opportunities and allowances for women in poverty and the right of women to control their reproductive lives. Now, in 1967, this is the Boston Marathon. And that is uh, Kathy Switzer. She's a runner. She enters the race as Kay Switzer. This is some of the, uh, some of the things that uh, most women were facing back uh, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The guy trying to throw her down to the ground, to the asphalt, is a guy named Jock Semple. He runs the Boston Marathon. The guy to your right, who looks like he's a well-developed, well-built guy, is, is uh, Catherine Switzer's boyfriend. Let's go back to April of 1967. Actually, let's go back to the fall of 1966. Catherine Switzer grew up as the daughter of a major in the United States Army, so failure was never really an option for her. While studying at Syracuse University, one of her coaches told her that a fragile woman could not run the Boston Marathon, so she trained in secret and entered the race. Frail women, dainty women, those were phrases tossed around in those days with, you know, they were just tossed around with other, other uh, not flattering um, uh, words about women. Women were the weaker sex, right? You heard that. So that was the mindset back in 1966, 67, fragile women can't run a Boston Marathon. Well, as they're getting closer, as Jock Semple is getting closer to knocking over Catherine Switzer, and look at the face of him, and right behind Catherine Switzer, uh, another guy right there, and they've got this heat, heat look on their face. The boyfriend jumps in and knocks down Jock Semple, and she goes on to finish her race in four hours, 20 minutes, proving Fragile, weaker sex, dainty woman could run the Boston Marathon. Uh, her boyfriend, 235 pounds worth of nationally ranked hammer thrower, who actually threw Jock Semple after Jock decided to physically remove her from the race. Could have been assault. Could have very easily been assault, but 1967, nobody thought it was that way. Uh, over in Greece, a military hunter takes over. Uh, Greece uh, in 1967, an outgrowth really of World War II. April 21st, 1967, there was a coup. Uh, 30 years of national division between the left and the right in Greece. All could be traced back to the time of resistance against the Axis allies, Germany and Italy, their occupation of Greece, the liberation 1944, and then Greece descended into a civil war between the communists and those guys who returned the government in exile. Uh, and they were not great people to the Greek people. Um, they, uh, imposed, uh, they imposed rigor on the Greek people. And here's one of the cartoons. Guilty Greek military hunter, long live in uh, uh, democratic Greece. And they accused the leadership of torture, repression, and murder. There was significant limitations on individuals' rights, free elections suspended, illegal to strike, illegal to demonstrate, illegal to talk against the government, and to congregate for any other purpose except going to church. 
the regime would fall in 1974. There was a war in Africa, Biafra. Biafra, that was the breakaway counties or territories within Nigeria, the South basically. The Republic of Biafra was a state in West Africa, started on May 30th, 1967, made up of states in the eastern region of Nigeria, and there are Nigerians who want their own homeland. Uh, the Civil War would start on July 6, 1967. Biafra represented nationalist aspirations of the Biafran people. They felt they could no longer coexist with the northern dominated federal government. The Biafrans were undermanned, and the Nigerians got help from the English. Uh, Biafra was formally recognized by Gabon, Haiti, Ivory Coast, Tanzania, and Zambia. Other nations provided support to Biafra. They included Israel, France, Spain, Portugal, Norway, Rhodesia, South Africa, and Vatican City. Notably absent, the United States. Lyndon Johnson did not get involved. By 1968, Nigerian troops surrounded Biafra, capturing the coastal oil facilities in the city of Port Harcourt. The Black Aid led to mass starvation. This would go on until January 1970, It'd be about 100,000 military casualties. And the estimate is between a half million and two million Biafran civilians died of starvation. And you might remember the old care commercials with, with that image you saw before, send money to us and we'll make sure these people get fed. Uh, there is the flag of Biafra, which lasted from 1967 to 1970, two and a half years of war. Eventually, the Biafran forces would surrender to the Nigerian federal military government. Some pockets of people to this day who want their own homeland, uh, but that didn't happen. That's the Loving family. Loving, James Loving and Mildred Jeter. They got married in Washington, D.C. around 1959. And they decided they wanted to move back to Virginia. Although if you live in the district, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Virginia is a mile away. But they decided they wanted to move to Virginia. And they were arrested because interracial marriage was against the law in Virginia. Supreme Court of the United States heard arguments, Loving vs. Virginia case in April 1967. Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving, interracial couple from Virginia, got married in the late 1950s in the district. They went back to Virginia and were charged with breaking the state law, which banned interracial marriage, and were jailed. The Loving sued the state of Virginia, argued the ban violated their 14th Amendment rights, and was unconstitutional. In June of uh, 1967, the Supreme Court ruled six to three that state bans on interracial marriage were unconstitutional, based solely on racial discrimination. The decision made interracial marriage legal throughout the United States. There were still 17 states at that point that it was illegal, mostly in the South. About six months later, a movie came out. Guess who's coming to dinner? featuring Sidney Poitier and Spencer Tracy. Three years earlier, Sidney Poitier became the first African-American to win a major Oscar, major Academy Award for his work. But he's in this movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which came out after the ruling, uh, but was made as the ruling, uh, as, as, the, as the case was winding into the Supreme Court. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is one of the few films of the time to depict an in interracial marriage in a positive light, interracial marriage historically had been illegal in most states of the United States, still legal in 1967 in 17 states until June 12th when the Supreme Court ruled. That was six months before the film was released. A kill, kill, kill! University of Wisconsin-Madison. Remember I told you about the first real anti-war protest was at the University of Wisconsin. That was in the uh, winter of 1967, in February. Uh, University of Wisconsin students blocked offices in Baskin Hall to protest the recruitment efforts on the campus of Dow Chemical. They made napalm, flammable gel that horribly burned victims. 
Uh, the students would come back in October, October 17th and 18th, 1967, another round of protests against Dow, not against the war per se, but against Dow. But this was the precursor to a much larger national anti-war march that would take place in Washington, D.C. the weekend following the October 17th, 18th protests. October 18th, the protests became violent, as you can see. Became real violent, uh, and there were two cops, um, one hitting a, a protester uh, with a baton, the other one taking him down um, around the neck. Uh, the protest made national news. Old Cronkite, old iron pants, I met twice. Old iron pants, Walter Cronkite had it on. Uh, Huntley Brinkley had it on. Howard K. Smith over at ABC had it on. So CBS with Cronkite, Huntley Brinkley, NBC, and uh, Howard K. Smith brought this into your living room. Into the living room. Uh, that didn't happen during the Korean War. The Vietnam War, the war spilling into your living room. Uh, it was the start of student demonstrations. And in Washington, these images in front of the Pentagon, uh, baton wielding, rifle uh, holding or bayonet holding uh, soldiers and um, they are going after unarmed protesters. U.S. troops use rifles in an encounter with anti-war demonstrators outside the Pentagon, which is outside of Washington, D.C., across the Potomac over in Arlington on October 21st, 1967. Not everybody was against the war. There were people who supported the war, and this is a demonstration in Massachusetts uh, that uh, was pro-war. And uh, 25,000 people in Wakefield, Massachusetts were in support of the Vietnam War the demonstration uh, sponsored by a 19-year-old high school senior, Paul Christopher, who decided to do this because he was very, very tired of anti-Vietnam War demonstrations and people not supporting the troops. Now, one woman explained to me that she felt that she was more patriotic in the anti-war demonstration because she was trying to uh, explain to people, we are trying to keep our soldiers from getting killed or maimed in Vietnam, bring them home. Uh, we support the troops and the way we support the troops, we're worried about their health, bring them home. That's the fight that's taking place uh, between the pro-Vietnam uh, people, which would be the silent majority as Richard Nixon would name them in 1969, and the demonstrators. Uh, the Folkies, Bob Dylan blowing in the wind, Phil Oaks, what are you fighting for? Barry McGuire, Eve of Destruction, Phil Oaks, I ain't marching anymore, Tom Paxson, and Lyndon told the nation. The Folkies were putting out records against Vietnam, but Barry Sadler put out the Ballad of the Green Berets, and he was on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1966. So even in the music industry, you got the pro-war people and the protesters. Sadler wrote the Ballad of the Green Beret in honor of James Gabriel, a wine green beret, member who was executed by the Viet Cong. On January 30th, 1966, Sadler debuted it on television on the Ed Sullivan Show on the very same stage as the Beatles, and I'll get this in, the very same stage as my cousin, Jerry Stiller, and his wife, Ann Mira. If you remember Stiller and Mira, Jerry was my cousin. Told me a lot about Sullivan. They were on about three dozen times. Uh, anyway, getting back to Sadler, um, the song became a big hit. Sold more than two million copies in the first five weeks it was available. Arlo Guthrie, oh, cool. If you remember Arlo Guthrie, this was uh, a couple of years ago when I traveled up to the Berkshires. Not going to the Berkshires this summer because of COVID, but anyway, I went to the Guthrie Center, and you might remember that Arlo Guthrie could not, could not enter the United States Armed Forces because he littered. Uh, Arlo Guthrie in 1965 is arrested and convicted of dumping trash illegally in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which later leads him to being rejected by his draft board down at Whitehall and Marks in Lower Manhattan, uh, at the draft board due to his criminal record of littering. And uh, that became the movie Alice's Restaurant. 
Uh, it became the song, 17 and a half minutes long, Alice's Restaurant, which is still played by some stations on radio, uh, terrestrial radio, every Thanksgiving at noon. Uh, and the Berkshire Eagle, which is still there, reported the incident back in 1965. Dateline, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, November 29th, 1965. Berkshire Eagle describes the conviction of Richard J. Roberts, age 19, and Arlo Guthrie, age 18, for illegally disposing of rubbish. Rubbish in a fine of $25 each and an order to remove the trash. The arresting officer was Stockbridge Police Chief William J. Overham, also known as Officer Obi in the record. The trial was presided over special Judge James E. Hannon. It identifies the incriminating evidence as an envelope addressed to a male resident of Great Barrington, presumably Ray Brock, rather than Guthrie. Arlo Guthrie is arrested, and uh, hey, <laughs> up, up in Stockbridge, they celebrate that. 50th anniversary of the arrest was in 1965, and the song came out in 1967. Now, Guthrie explained the song, saying that he believes there's such thing as just wars, and the message of this particular song was targeted at Vietnam, but it wasn't necessarily an anti-war song. It was an anti-stupid song. Guthrie is thrown in with a bunch of people, including people who are in for rape and other things, robbery. And they ask him, what are you in for? And he said, littering. And, and the song goes on and on and on and on. Alice's Restaurant. Now, there's another song that comes out in 1967 by Dionne Warwick, I Say a Little Prayer. And uh, I ask people, uh, generally, what do you think of this song? Pro-Vietnam, pro anti-Vietnam, is a Vietnam song at all? And you get back some interesting responses. Um, first of all, people didn't realize it was an anti-Vietnam or pro-Vietnam song. They didn't realize it was a Vietnam song. But Hal David writes the song in 1965. Hal David, the partner of uh, Burt Backrack. Hal David wrote the lyrics and Burt Backrack did the music. And Hal David tried to put himself in the position of a woman. A woman whose man, whether it's her husband or her boyfriend, uh, is off serving in Vietnam. And, and how she wakes up every morning, I say a little prayer uh, as she's getting ready to go to work herself. The uh, song written in 1965 is recorded in 1969. Uh, there were 10 takes uh, done by the Wrecking Crew um, and sung by Dionne Warwick. And, uh, Backrack never liked the song, never liked how the track was, it was rushed, just didn't like it. And he put it on the shelf, and then they decided in September of 1967 to release it, of course, Say a Little Prayer. It's a huge, huge, huge hit from Dionne Warwick, and it was a song about the Vietnam War, but it wasn't pro, it wasn't against. It was done by the viewpoint, the narrator is worrying about her man serving in Vietnam. Twiggy! Twiggy got the Beatles treatment when she got to the United States. Uh, she was a model. As, uh, <laughs> uh, I can't think of the singer right now. Uh, Boney Maroney uh, is the song. I think it's Larry Williams. And she's as skinny as a stick of macaroni, Boney Maroney. Larry Williams actually did that song. Um, and John Lennon would do that song again in 1974 for his rock and roll album. 75 it came out. Twiggy arrived in Newark at, in March of 1967. She got the Beatles treatment. The New Yorker Life in Newsweek reported on the Twiggy phenomenon in 1967. The New Yorker magazine devoted nearly 100 pages to the subject. She became an international sensation modeling in France, Japan, and America. Twiggy was almost as big as the Beatles when they came over in 1964 uh, in her own way. My favorite movie of all time is The Producers. It was released in 1967, done by, uh, what was his name? Um, Melvin Kaminsky. Melvin Kaminsky did, did this. And the only reason I bring this up is that there is a phrase in this movie that lived on and lives on to today, although the movie still lives on as well. 
Uh, the Producers, a satirical comedy film written and directed by Mel Brooks. Brooks won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. Dec decades later, the film was selected for preservation, uh, for preservation in the National Film Registry and placed 11th on the AFI's 100 Years, 100 Laughs list. I got it higher, but yeah, that's me. Um, I love this movie. I love this movie. I know the dialogue of this movie because I grew up with some of the people in this movie uh, in the 1960s. Uh, the term creative accounting was first used in 1967 in the producers, and you hear that term today, uh, but that's a product of creative accounting. We do economics as well. Creative accounting. Max Bialystok, you keep saying that, but you don't tell me how. How could a producer make more money with a flop and a hit? It's, a sim matter, it's a simply a matter of creative accounting. Let's assume, just for a moment, that you're a dishonest man, and Max would say, assume away, assume away. And, uh, and Bloom would explain, and he says, you're an accountant. The word count is in your title. It's a noble man. You know, move a couple decibels. Tell him I took a Turkish bath. Creative accounting comes out of the producers. Uh, I have one of these today, and probably most of you have one of these today. One of these happens to be a cell phone. But this guy in Tokyo, thanks to the Nippon Electric Company, uh, has his version of the video phone, which became available in 1967. The multi-channel video phone was invented and installed by the Nippon Electric Company, cost about $1,300 US for a one channel setup, which means you can make a call, unlike today, unlike Zoom, which I could have done on here, uh, and you can talk to somebody on the other end. Remember, long distance rates applied back in those days. Um, so <laughs> you could make your cell phone call, but it wasn't a cell phone, you had to sit down in front of a telephone, and a uh, monitor in your major call, but it was available 53 years ago. Hey, that guy is playing chess against a computer up in Boston. Robert Q, a computer program to play chess, was beaten in its first competition with a human in the monthly Boylston Chess Club tournament up in Boston. The computer was at MIT in Cambridge. Carl Wagner, the opponent, made his moves at in uh, YMCU, several miles away in Boston. The moves were relayed to computer by teletype, good old fashioned teletype. And Wagner won, computer lost. Expo 67 Montreal, I wasn't there in 67, but uh, that ball was still there in 1982 when I was there. Come on, come on to Expo 67 Montreal. The official World's Fair, the New York World's Fair was never an official World's Fair in 1964 and 65. It was a renegade's World's Fair. This was an official World's Fair. The World's Fair was held in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada from uh, April 27th to October 29th, uh, 1967. It's considered to be the most successful World's Fair of the 20th century. It celebrated Canada's 100th anniversary as a nation. Um, I was supposed to be in uh, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island in June on the Celebrity Cruise Ship. I speak on cruises. Uh, I was supposed to be there last year. I never got there last year because there was a massive nor'easter that went through PEI and this year we had COVID, uh, the uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. So I have never gotten to see what this building looked like in Federal Hall where Canada started and I'm hoping sometime in my lifetime, I'll be able to get back to Charlottetown PEI to see what that building ended up looking like after they rebuilt it. Anyway, 1967, the French president Charles de Gaulle is in Montreal and he's addressing an adoring crowd in some uh, uh, square in Montreal and he's in the hotel and he makes a big mistake. On July 24th, 1967, de Gaulle stood on the balcony, Montreal City Hall actually that was, and shouted, Viva le Quebec Libre, to a crowd. De Gaulle gave an international voice to Quebec's sovereign movement, a movement that in Quebec was marred by terrorist attacks, mostly mail bombs, uh, by 1967, 63, 67. 
No, it was shut down in 1970. Prime Minister Lester Pearson, he's got an airport named after him now in Toronto, criticized the speech, saying De Gaulle's statements were un unacceptable to the Canadian people. De Gaulle never went to the Expo 67 Montreal like he was supposed to do so. And we finish up 1967, the 20th century limited passenger train. The train that went from New York to Chicago made its final run on December 4th, 1967. It started 65 years earlier in 1902. And there is the 20th century limited. And I remember a Jack Benny program where the cast was supposedly going to New York from Chicago on the 20th Century Limited back during World War II. I am a big Jack Benny fan. And uh, my little radio station, we used to run it. I used to tape all the shows to listen to the Jack Benny show, who was great. Great on radio. Uh, December 3rd, 1967, Dr. Christian Barnard uh, transplanted the heart of an accident victim, Denise Darville, into the chest of a 54-year-old South American, South African man, Louis Wartansky. Uh, Wartansky regained full consciousness, began to talk to his wife, and then caught pneumonia, died 18 days later. But it was the first successful heart transplant, and there is uh, the Dr. Christian Barnard. And finally, it's Christmas 1967. And you can see all the destruction around these two guys. These two guys have set up. Got his radio there. It's Christmas, and they're celebrating Christmas. Some hill, some jungle in Vietnam. There was hope in 1967, I suppose. Well, there was hope in Vietnam. Bob Hope took his USO show uh, to Vietnam to entertain the troops. 1967 would end with the war, with the war continuing, not only in Vietnam, but also in Biafra uneasiness in the Middle East. 1968, the calendar would flip in a couple days. In 1968 was probably the most unstable year of the swinging 60s in the United States with the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson not running for re-election, the Democratic uh, Convention in Chicago. A lot of things that happened in 1968, left over from 1967, that would not be solved. Vietnam's case until 1973. And uh, some issues have never been solved. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, I am here for you to discuss. We could talk. And what I am going to do is unmute everybody. And uh, if you have any questions, any comments, criticisms, I'm all ears. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, little, little get together that we had. Anybody have any questions, any comments? Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Who, who is this, by the way? I want to see your phone number. It's Bonnie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just want to thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any other questions, any other comments? Any, anybody have anything to say about 1967? We got something in the uh, chat here. Hold on. We'll, uh, okay. Uh, from Nanette. Peter, thank you. This was great. Thank you, Nanette. I was going to say no, no, Nanette, but that's 1920. Uh, and that's Harry Frizet. Thank you so much, uh, Nanette. I appreciate that. And um, if we are done, uh, are we done? Uh, yes or no? Well, if nobody has anything else to say, I think we're done. <laughs> okay, I hope that, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, I'm gonna give uh, the library a copy of this and you can put it up on the website. I know that I've done this at other libraries and they decided after listening to this, hey, let's put it up because it's a pretty good, pretty good reminder of what happened in 1967 and how some of the things from 1967 have not changed in 2020. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank the Copic Library uh, for inviting me. We're doing this again in September. So thank you uh, for inviting me and thank you for inviting me in January. Hope everybody enjoyed it and I appreciate you being here and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Bye-bye now.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.